It's great to see all of you here today. And today we're going to talk about this idea of gratitude. But we're not going to talk about the idea of gratitude as we used to do. In fact, every November that I have been at this church, I've preached on gratitude. And you're probably going to be grateful I'm not preaching on it the same way today. We're going to talk about what it really means to see what God does in our life. Not so much just to believe, but you have to go beyond belief. You have to see what God does in each of our lives. And to do that, we're going to talk about the story of the ten lepers. That's the story that, that appears in the Gospel of Luke about Jesus healing ten lepers, and, and they run off, cleansed of leprosy, but they go, only one comes back. Because only one saw who Jesus was. The others had faith. They had believed, that's even what Jesus said, your faith will heal you. But one returned. One returned because one not only believed, but one saw. And so we're going to look at what that really means and how it affects us as a church. Uh, but before we do that, let us begin as we always do, with this powerful affirmation. <coughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. Let, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now we do have several announcements. Tomorrow, mark this on your calendar, is church council at 2.30. All are welcome to attend. Uh, certainly, um, as we continue to plan for the end of the year and plan for next year, uh, church council has a very important task to undertake. And so tomorrow is our November meeting here at 2.30, and all are welcome to attend and participate. Now, I going to ask for a bit of, as they say, pastoral privilege. Uh, yesterday, I came into the church, and as is my custom, I walked back and I looked at the sign-up sheet. And whoa, to my surprise, uh, there will be no church in December. <laughs> I've actually canceled it. Uh, I had no choice. No one has signed up for anything. Other than Gene. Thank you, Gene. Raise your hand. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's give Gene a round of applause. <laughs> the only person to sign up for anything in December. Okay? Now, here's the reality. As you know, in Christianity, December's kind of an important month. You know what I mean? It, it, it's got some significance, right? And so it troubles me that no one has signed up for anything. Okay? Other than Gene. Thank you, Gene. Uh, so what I'm going to ask to do today, after the service, I want everyone to pray about being part of serving this church. You know, I've said many, many times, this church has been here in our 181st year because of the people of the church, not because of the pastor. You know, I'm the 65th pastor here, pastors come and go, but the people of this church have made it work. They've made it work through hardship, through hard times, through wars, depressions, you name it, because they always got involved. You know, take a look at some of the pictures on the, on the hallway here. Take a look at the pictures in that book, in the books we have. There are very few pictures of the pastor. Okay? Now, one reason is most pastors weren't as good looking as I am, and so they didn't get a lot of pictures. Uh, what are you laughing at? <laughs> You're back in dreamland. 
<laughs> but seriously, it's up to the laity of this church to volunteer and keep it going. And so I'm asking by the end of this day, I want December completely filled. The only thing I would tell you, we are, we'll be talking about Christmas Eve to fix the time tomorrow at council. So Christmas Eve can stay, that line can stay blank for the moment. However, I want every other line filled by the end of today. And we can do it. If you've never been a liturgist, then you know, speak to, to Ed or to Penny or to the people who have done it. It's a great ministry. Uh, we, need, we need people as host and hostess for our, our coffee hour after communion servers. You know, we will have communion during December, obviously. We need people to, to be our communion servers. Uh, do we have family and friends in December or not? No. Okay. So we will not have family and friends until January. But again, by the end of the day, let's fill up December. Okay, because when I looked at that, seriously, it appears that Church of Four Seasons, Church, <laughs> Salem Church, is going to close on November 30th. And we'll reopen again in January, hopefully if we can find some folks to volunteer. But all joking aside, I, I want to see those lists full. And if you've never done any of these things before, you know how we are. We will gladly help you. Okay? Everybody will, will help anyone who would like to try a new area of ministry. You will not do it alone. No one is going to hold your feet to the fire. But let's get out there and be the church that Salem Church always has been. Let's get December full, and as we go into 2025, let's make certain this is a church of the people of Salem, not just a pastor, or not just a few people who already volunteer. Everybody, no matter who you are, has a role. Age is no barrier. Youth is no barrier. Let's all get involved. So thank you for my, uh, my moment of pastoral privilege. Are there any other announcements today? Yes, yes, we do have a special announcement. Um, Julia, raise your hand, Julia, so we know who you are. She will be baptized on December 15th here at the church during the worship service, which is a great time to be baptized right before we celebrate Christmas. Um, following that, I, I would like us to have a little reception for her and her family uh, afterwards. I think that will be, that will be great. Uh, we were going to baptize her in full immersion, but it would require me actually submerging the conference room. You can't do that. <laughs> yes? Can I throw water on her? <laughs> you throw water on so many people. <laughs> she will be baptized at, at the baptismal font, and that's just great. Yes? We will be serving a luncheon after her baptism here. All right, thank you. So we'll be bringing food in, so be hungry. Come hungry, yes, well thank you. No, I think it's a great privilege. I love it when we do the baptisms in the church. It is, uh, you know, it's a beautiful sign of who we are as Christians, and certainly that's just great. We're very excited and just blessed that you are gonna be with us and do it that day. So that is December 15th. Let's fill the place, all right? Any other announcements? Family and friends. Excuse me? Family and friends. Oh, family and friends is coming up this Wednesday at uh, one one o'clock right all right again we're, we're trying some new time experiment there's some people who do not like to drive after dark and i certainly understand that so it'll be at one o'clock here on wednesday uh, always a good time so let's have a great turnout for that all right. any other announcements all right there being none as we walked in today we walked in out of individual lives and things that are going on and things going on in our nation, our world, whatever it might be. But as you come together today as the people of God, we want to express God's love and peace to one another. So let's extend a sign of that love and peace that we know through Christ. Please stand as you are able and, and join me in the call to worship. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Amen. 
even though I walk through the darkest valley. I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. All right, please join us in our opening hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin, page 365, three verses with an introduction. the difference between having faith and seeing. Having faith or believing in God is one thing, and that is a gift of God's Holy Spirit, but seeing what God does and seeing what God did and who God was in Jesus Christ is a very significant step that unfortunately many of us never take. Many of us never get beyond that idea that we simply believe. There's nothing wrong with that. We are a people of faith. We are a people of faith by grace, God's grace. But what if we went the next step? What if we saw who Jesus was and what Jesus revealed? What if we saw God's work in our life? And that's why as we gather for this time that historically we call joys and concerns, we gather for this time because that's when we talk about what we see. What we see, and you know, it's not a matter of circumstance. It's not a matter of luck. It's not simply a matter of all things coming together at the right time. You know, people say, the universe came together at the right time and I was blessed. It is a matter of seeing God at work. Often in ways so subtle we may not detect it. Oh, we want a God of, we want a God of, of miraculous things. But really, we have a God who works in small ways and ways large. We have a God who works in all aspects of our life. And today, on our sanctuary light, we remember Alex and Barry, Donna's father and her brother. We remember their life 
in the way that people navigate this world, in the way that people walk through this world. Because in ways large and small, they were part of who Donna is today. They helped to write your story. And we need to remember that as we reflect upon those who have gone before. <clears throat> that many times, many times as they walk this world, and this world can be really tough. This world can be really difficult. And we all know that. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that this is a joy ride through life. It's not. But consider the strength. Consider the perseverance. Consider the hope. And as we look at the sanctuary light today in memory of Alex and Barry, let us remember them in that way. Let us remember the navigation of life, walking life's journey. And so thank you, Donna, for sharing them with us today. And thank you for their memories. Also today, my joy. My joy is that this congregation continues to thrive. And I don't mean just survive. You know, when I came over and the list was, I'm not going to give you another speech on the empty sign-up sheet. You're grateful for that, aren't you, Mary? I can see you smile. <laughs> but, you know what? I was looking back at the sign-up sheets and I saw all the people who've done various things over the course of the past year. And I looked at all the people we memorialized in the sanctuary light. I looked at all the people who've been communion servers and all of those things and I thought, you know, even though I was a little discouraged that December seemed just a bit vacant and I thought I'll be here by myself, even though I was a bit discouraged, it gave me hope. Because my joy is that no matter what the circumstance, this congregation, this church, has always responded. Think about that. How many other churches can say they've been here for 180 years? We are one of the oldest churches in the entire Indiana Conference. That's phenomenal. Right now, you know, churches are celebrating, well, we've been here 35 years, you know, and we're, we're just celebrating our 15th year in existence. But we can say we've been here over 180 years. We're in 100, our 181st year of existence. And think about this. None of us in this room were here when the church started. None of us. We've had grandparents, great-grandparents, relatives who were part of this church. But they had to do the same thing we are called to do today. And that was my joy. Uh, for some reason, after I saw the empty sign-up sheet and I was kind of depressed, um, you know, I'm walking back to our house and I thought, you know what? I wonder how many times in 180 years did a pastor have an empty sign-up sheet and the pastor would stand up and say, you know what, folks? We need to rebuild the church because it just got burned down. <laughs> or how many times would a pastor stand up there and say, you know what? We're going to have to have extra volunteers because all the men of the church are off in the Civil War. Or how many times would a pastor stand up and say, you know what, we need more people to help with, with our funerals because we have so many people who've fallen victim to the Spanish flu. Think about that. And every time, the people of Salem have responded. And that gives me great joy. Great joy. And that's my joy for today. So other, other joys and concerns, and when we say a concern, we're not saying God isn't aware of that concern. We're saying that we're surrendering that concern, that burden on our heart to God, and we're surrendering it to one another so that we never walk any journey alone. So, joys, concerns. Yes, Donna. Um, I'm thankful this afternoon we're going to uh, Elaine's function. We'll be listening to some good singing have a lovely dinner, luncheon, dinner, and that means I don't have to cook today. <laughs> that's right. Now that, that is today. We want to keep that event in our prayers. That's always a very successful event. But very, very good group. Yes? I had Chris Paul yesterday. Uh, Tammy is home from the hospital. She's been home. And she was she was doing pretty good yesterday. That's great. Okay. We're going to keep Tammy in our prayers. We keep Elaine in our prayers, not only for today, but as she continues her treatment. And we, we want her to know that this community is lifting, lifting her up in prayer as we're lifting Tammy up in prayer. And John as well. 
But we lift Chris up, too. He's walking this journey with him. We want him to know that, uh, you know, we pray that God's hand is upon him. Yeah, his son was trying to get him to come to Michigan for a couple of days to get away from everything that no, I understand. he's not going to do. I certainly understand. And this afternoon, I will be conducting the funeral service for Shirley Clausen. Uh, certainly a stellar part of this church, as Laura reminded me, a major part of our Sunday school for a long, long time. Shirley has some wonderful memories. In fact, she has an entire box of pictures from Sunday school classes over the years and different events at the church that they're going to have the church go through. And so we'll have a lot more history. But that will be at Bartholomew Funeral Home. Uh, visitation this afternoon is from 2 until 4, and then the memorial service is at for. So you want to want to pray for the Clausen family. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, um, I uh, asked for prayers last week uh, for Matt and Carol Reed for Camden. Mm -hmm. um, Camden has uh, taken a turn for the worse, and um, he was moved uh, to a facility in the suburbs of Chicago. Okay. Um, where he has a nursing staff um, of at least four people around okay. the clock. Um, so just continue prayers for him. We'll do. We'll continue keeping our prayers for you. Yes, Adam and then John. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> prayer for Donna and myself because uh, my little truck has died and no saving it. So uh, I'm going to start our search for the other truck. All right. We will do that, Adam. And they talk to God. That they do when made a little truck rest in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, John. And for uh, the family of Frank Berenger. Frank he Berenger. He passed away in the 70s. One of the guys that went fishing with the, the Fury all the time. Okay, yes, Frank. Okay. We will pray for Frank. And also we want to have a special prayer for Julia, which we're going to do each and every week up to her baptism. Just to pray for God's hand to be upon her and God's wisdom to guide her and sustain her. All right, let us center ourselves in the presence of a loving God, a God who walks each and every human journey, and a God whose grace will fill all of our hearts by the power of God's Spirit. Holy and living God, we celebrate your love today, for your grace is abundant, your mercy is unending. We thank you for your presence with those who who walk these journeys of suffering in life, of treatment. We pray that in that, in that presence, there is a sense of your, your healing strength and your comfort, and we're just so grateful for that. We pray for Elaine, and we pray for Tammy. We pray indeed for little Camden. We pray for, we pray for those who walk this journey with them, and we're just so thankful that your hand is upon all people involved in these journeys of health. We pray for John, and we pray we pray for Chris, we pray for Camden's mom and dad. We pray for the family of Frank Berenger who's passed into eternal life and may, may his family look upon his, the legacy of his life with joy. No doubt a life lived joyfully, a life lived fully. And now may they take comfort in the promise of Easter dawn. We pray for Julia as she prepares for baptism to enter into the fullness of life of the church, fullness of life as your disciple. May your Holy Spirit be upon her. May her heart be open to the, to the role you would have her play in your kingdom. And may she know a strength that surrounds her is from you. We pray indeed in memory of Alex and Barry today. May their lives stand as a tribute to all of us. And may we look at their lives as an example of lives lived within the human journey but lives always sustained by your love and your peace. We pray indeed for Adam and Donna as they prepare this search for a vehicle. May they be guided by your wisdom. We just thank you so much that your wisdom touches every aspect of our life. We are so grateful for that. We pray for this congregation, for the good people of Salem United Methodist. May we continue to not survive, but may we continue to thrive by the power of your Holy Spirit by the grace that fills our hearts, and by the mercy that covers us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please.
join me in the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Holy God, you are a God of the interruption. Those grace inspired moments when our only dependence is on you and your providential care. Yet we often fail to accept our vulnerability as an act of faith and a true coming together of heaven and earth. You are a merciful God. Forgive us for failing to see your light in the brokenness and your faithfulness in times of exile. Renew our hearts so that we may be grateful for your presence in the interruptions of life. Through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, lead us to witness the power of your reconciling love to all people. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the time when we center ourselves in stillness in the presence of our Lord. You know, we only have a few instances in the Gospels where Jesus actually prays. Now, we know that he prayed consistently and constantly. But there are a few times where the Gospel writers have elected to actually share those prayers with us. But I have to believe that as Jesus prayed, so much of that prayer time was in stillness with his Father. And that is why each time we gather as the people of Salem, we still our hearts, we still our minds, we still our souls, we still our lips, so that we can experience the fullness of God. So that we can experience the fullness of God, not burdened by our own petitions, not burdened by our own concerns, but only open to God's will in our life. And today, as we do that, as we do that, I want us to simply, I want us to simply put one word on our hearts. Don't think about it. Don't try to explain it. And that word is see, S-E-E. -E. Put that word on your heart and let God speak into you today, right now, what that word means in your life, in your family's life, and in the life of this congregation. So let us now center ourselves in the silence, the silence of our Lord. Amen. Amen. And sometimes we need to take that interruption in our life because, you know, our life is filled with language. When you think about it, our entire day is generally filled with talking to people, talking at people, as I'm doing now, talking with people. But sometimes language can be our greatest barrier to God because we use language to rationalize. We use language to explain away those things that separate us from God. We use language to deny the spiritual, the emotional, and sometimes the physical pain we feel in our lives because language somehow can alleviate that. It really doesn't take it away, though. And it separates us from this great experience of God's grace lived, lived out through God's Holy Spirit. So let us spend time as we prepare to go into Advent, and into the feast of Christmas, let us spend time to listen to God. You know, so much of what we talk about in Advent, about preparing the way, is about listening. Listening to God. That was the message of John the Baptist. That was the message of Jesus. Prepare ye the way, prepare ye the way, not by your words, no matter how glorious they are. Not by your sermons, no matter how brilliant they may be. I'm not saying they are but preparing it by being still and listening to God. And that's a very difficult thing to do. 
We now enter in, though, to prayers of the people. And what I'd like to do today, I'm going to do something a little different for prayers of the people. This is something that we've seen done in a couple different churches. But I don't want people to, I don't want people to name names. We did that in our, our joys and concerns and God sighting. I want people to think about what we can do as the church of Jesus Christ. Okay? And I just want to go around and just, you can just raise your hand. One thing we can do as the church of Jesus Christ. And that's going to be our prayer today. That's going to be our prayers of the people. So, holy God, as we come to you today, we lift up what you are calling on each of these hearts in this room today to do, to be the church of your son. It's not about us. It's not about our own journeys. It's not about our own struggles. It's not about our own losses. We're rising above that today, for we know you're in all of those circumstances. It's about what we can be as the church of Jesus Christ. And the very first thing we are called to be, in my estimation, we are called to be a healer. So we pray, Father, that you'll guide us to heal, heal brokenness, heal divisions, heal uncertainty, heal injustice. What else are we called to be as the church? Yes. Pray that we can help others to know uh, God's love and to see God's love in everyone around us. Oh God, we pray that, that we can open the hearts of those we touch, directly and indirectly, to, to know and experience your love, to know and experience your grace, to know and experience the fact that we can see your love in everyone we meet causes to do that. Anyone else? Yes. I would say be kind. There's so much going on right now and we kind of ignore people that you know went to the grocery store and, and we just act like they're not there Right. instead of saying you know How, how's your day but there's not a lot of kindness. It's very true. And holy God, we pray that you will inspire us by the power of your spirit to be a people of kindness. Not simply a people being nice, but a people of being kind, a people of being compassion, a people who will evidence your love through our kindness and through our acceptance of people, to walk beyond how we define people and enter into what it really means that all people are created in your image and likeness. Anyone else? I would say to seek him out every day. Excellent. Father God, we pray that we may seek out your son and to seek you each and every day. May our prayer be to see you more clearly. May our prayer be to love you each and every day. And may there never be a day in our life when we do not reach out and seek you as our first passion, as our first call, as our first mission. So holy God, we lift up to you this call to be a healer, to reveal your love in the way we live, in the way we serve, and to cause others to experience that, to invite others into that reconciling love, and to cause people to see your love revealed in others. And may we be a people characterized by kindness and by compassion. And most of all, each day, may we seek you in all ways, in the stillness of our hearts, in the prayers of our lips, and in the witness of our faith. And we pray all of these things in the merciful and loving name of the one who perfects our faith, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. We now bring forward our gifts.
Please stand for the doxology. reconciling love, your message of hope, your message of grace to all we encounter. Open our eyes to acts of injustice, persecution, and marginalization so that we may carry your love to all who suffer. Lead us to those who cry out to know the hope that is found in your Son. Lead us to those who cry out to know that certain peace that comes only through the power of your Spirit. Send us forth as agents of your grace and bearers of the good news. In your son's blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we have a reading from the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you were persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This morning's gospel, please stand as you are able. Uh, this morning's gospel lesson comes from John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 3 and 6 through 8. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Nearby stood six stone jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars up with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. The gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As I said at the beginning of the service today, we're going to talk about the difference between believing and seeing. And we see that throughout the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see that in all of the Gospels. We see all of these people who would come to Jesus and they would walk away believing that, believing that this is Jesus. They would walk away and you know what, I wonder how far they got before that started to fade away. It's just like the 10 lepers we'll, we'll read about later this month in the Gospel, we're in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus cleanses 10 lepers they head off. He said, by your faith you've been healed. Go show the priests that you no longer have leprosy, that you can be welcomed back into the community. Only one leper came back, fell at the feet of Jesus because he saw who Jesus was. It was an interruption in the lives of those lepers. And today we have two stories of interruptions. One is that grand and glorious story we hear about Paul on the road to Damascus. He's like riding around on his donkey. All of a sudden he gets struck and he's knocked on the ground and he hears the voice of Jesus. Okay? That's something, you know, high drama at that point. 
but his life was interrupted. His life was interrupted because most of his life had spent studying, studying the, the law, studying the Torah, under the most famous rabbi at the time, Paul and Sutton, he was a wonderful student. So wonderful, in fact, that he saw this new movement where they were claiming that Jesus is the Messiah. He saw this as a threat. These are blasphemers. These people have to be eliminated. These people cannot be allowed to exist. And so what he would do is he would go out and he could take them into custody. He had the power to arrest and then, then take them off to Jerusalem where they would be tried before some kind of tribunal. And even if people acted on their own, such as when Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned and Paul observed it and watched it happen. But all of a sudden, all of that was interrupted. His life was interrupted. And then in the gospel, we have another kind of interruption. It might seem like a minor interruption, but it was all of a sudden Jesus and his disciples are at this wedding, and in those days, in ancient times, a wedding was an entire community celebration that would have gone on for several days, and so you know the wine was going to keep flowing. The wine was going to be, be present and prevalent, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they're out of wine. What an interruption. Yeah. What an interruption in the normalcy of life. But then Jesus steps in and performs what we have as the very first miracle recorded in the Gospel of John. Jesus sees these ceremonial water jugs, and these were used for cleansing rituals. And Jesus changes them into wine. Changes them into wine as almost prefiguring that his blood in some way would be a cleansing ritual for the people. But that was another interruption. One, a grand interruption. God appears and, and Jesus speaks directly to Paul, who is now blind. He is blinded by the flash of lightning that caused him to fall off his, his donkey. The other, a simple wedding that people attended to celebrate, but yet it was interrupted. Why is that important? It's important because Jesus speaks to us most clearly in the interruptions of our <coughs> life. Think about that. Jesus speaks to us most clearly in the times that our lives are interrupted. In the times that things do not go when we feel that we are in total control. Think about that. Think about those times in our life when things are just going well. I know it's it's interesting because in, in my prior ministry, and you work with youth groups a lot, and you know all of a sudden when you get a youth group together and you go to camp or something like that, they all stand up and they'll give you these marvelous testimonies. Oh, my life is wonderful. Jesus has moved in my life. He's my Lord and Savior. I've been saved, I've been sanctified, and I've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Then they grow up. And then all of a sudden the parent dies. Unexpected. All of a sudden, the beloved grandparent gets cancer, suffers. All of a sudden, they're starting to see they're out of control. I can't control this anymore. All of a sudden, they get married. And oh, they think they're going to be so happy. And all of a sudden, that marriage starts to fall apart. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's brokenness there. Another interruption. For you see, what happens in the interruptions of our life is all of a sudden we recognize one very important fact. One important fact we never want to talk about when people are grown up. One important fact we never want to even talk about in church. We're not in control. We're not in control. Oh, I wish we were. There are certain things in life we can do. There are certain things in life we can do to prevent this or prevent that. There are certain things that we can do to, to maybe make ourselves safer. All those things we can do, but there's going to be those interruptions. And what happens in those interruptions? That is when we hear God with the most clarity. Because all of a sudden we realize in the interruptions of life, our dependence is on God, not on us. And oh, you know, I wish our dependence could be totally on us sometimes. I would love to right every problem I see. I would love to right every injustice I see. I would love to walk into every hospice room and say, you're healed, be healed. 
Get out of that bed right now. Because you're healed. But you see, we're not in charge. We can't control. But in the interruptions of our life, we're going to hear God with the most clarity we have ever heard. I have never experienced God as strongly and as clearly, except in those times when my life was totally interrupted. When everything I thought I had controlled ended, where everything I'd built my life around was gone, and all of a sudden, here I am, all alone, not knowing what to do, I had no place to turn, no place to go, and yet, that is when I experienced God. Because all of a sudden, I came to an important realization. And this was the biggest shock of my life. It's not about me. And I had a hard time accepting that. Because most of my life, it's always been about me. And so when I would talk to God in the times of my life when I didn't have an interruption, my life was going pretty smooth. You know, I went through school. Somehow I got through high school out of pure sympathy from teachers. Talked my way out of high school. Talked my way out of college. Seven years, talked my way out of college, and finally talked my way out. But the strange part of it is, I thought it was all about me. And so I could recall going to church, and I would tell God, what you're going to do for me this week, God? God, you know, i got a lot of stuff coming up. i got this exam. I didn't really study for it. But if you want me to do anything for you, God, uh, help me get the answers to this test. You know, I remember when you go to law school, you take a test called the LSAT, LSATs. And you, I remember going to take the LSATs at University of Illinois, and I'm sitting in this room with all these people, and I go, God, make me, sp I did, this is a true story. This will convince you how far off the grid I can be. God, make me smarter than all these people here, you know? I'm looking at these people, and I go, look at that guy. He doesn't even look like a lawyer, you know? But the fact of the matter is, I took the LSATs. God didn't get me into Harvard. I said, God, God, I think we talked about me going to Harvard Law School. I was pretty clear about that, you know? But that's the reality, isn't it? It's all about us. And when we have an interruption in life, all of a sudden we realize it's not about us anymore. Our dependence is now on God. And after that, after my entire life, everything that I thought I'd worked for was gone. I finally realized, in that interruption, I experienced God with more clarity than I've ever experienced God at any other time. You know, I have a good friend who is a pastor, still a pastor, but he has had chronic illnesses ever since seminary. For some unknown reason, this guy has suffered immensely. He's had cancer. He's had two or three different bouts with cancer and gone through all of these treatments and suffered through the treatments, and yet continues to pastor, continues to minister. And I would always ask him, how do you keep doing that? You know, one little thing goes wrong in my life. And all of a sudden, I start asking God, God, what's going on, you know? Perhaps you've forgotten who I am here. What's going on? And he, you know what he said? He said, you know what? The first time I was diagnosed, he said, I was angry at God. I was angry at God, and I was angry at myself because I knew there were some things in my life that had contributed to me getting this disease. He said, then I got treatment, and then I went into remission. And then it came back, and he said, I was still angry at God. He said, God, you know, I'm a pastor. What, what's going on here? And then he said, the third time, the third time, I was diagnosed. The cancer had returned. He said, I, I knelt all by myself in the sanctuary of the Methodist church where he was serving. He said, I, he knelt all by myself and he said, God, how can I glorify you in this situation? And with that, his entire attitude changed. Because he saw in that interruption an opportunity to reveal God's love, reveal God's strength, and to see what God was doing. And he saw the strength that God gave him. He saw the hope that he was giving other people. He saw the way he was still able to reveal God's love. 
And so had it not been for that interruption, he said he would have never understood that it's all about God. That we are image bearers of God. But until our lives are interrupted, we become image bearers of who we want to be. We become image bearers of who we think we should be. We become image bearers of who we pretend that we are. And so my message today is this. My message is this. Thank God for the interruptions in our life. And when those interruptions occur, let us ask that basic question. God, how can I glorify you in what's going on? How can I reveal your love in what's happening? And it doesn't mean you're going to ignore the problems. It doesn't mean we don't grieve. It doesn't mean we don't cry. It doesn't mean we don't hurt. It doesn't mean we don't suffer. It doesn't mean we don't get angry and lament what's happening. But it means that in that vulnerability, we take away all of those things that keep us from God. We take away all of those barriers, those boundaries, those blockades, those impediments that keep us from truly experiencing God in our life because we are so busy trying to be in control. The very first lesson that Jesus taught is it's all about God. And that needs to be our very first lesson as Christians. Amen. Amen. Now it's interesting that we enter into what we call the Great Thanksgiving. And sometimes I think we skip over that name because those of you who might have grown up in another faith tradition, this would be called Eucharist. And Eucharist is the Greek word for Thanksgiving. And sometimes we forget that when we come to this table, it is an act of Thanksgiving. We are receiving God's grace in a special way. And we come with hearts of gratitude. We come in this great thanksgiving, which removes those barriers for all are welcome to come. So please join me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and right joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you father almighty creator of heaven and earth and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn holy 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 lord god of power and might heaven and earth are full of your glory hosanna in the highest blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and glorious resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he would give himself up for us, he took bread in his sacred hands, he broke the bread, he gave it to those gathered at table, and he gives it to us today, saying, Take eat each of you, this is my body, which is given for you. When the supper was ended, he took the cup again. He gave thanks to his Father Almighty. He passed the cup to his friends, and he passes it to you, saying, Take and drink from this, each of you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant that will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time you do this, do so in memory of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ, offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. For all your Holy Spirit and us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all glory and honor endures, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 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 And now let us join together and say the perfect prayer that our Lord and Savior gave us. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Body of Christ, broken for us. The blood of Christ, shed for us. The invitation has been given. The table is set. All are welcome to come and to receive. Please join me in this morning's closing prayer. Almighty God, 